My name is Phil Wislowski. I teach at uh, Mesa Community College a variety of open source stuff. In fact, some folks have actually had me in class. Uh, I got to see a large portion of Jill's t-shirt collection in the MySQL class alone. Um, well, I'm actually, just probably not that plain large. Plain t-shirts. Huh? Plain t-shirts from now on. Yeah. <laughs> Straight black, nothing. Yeah. Um, but I've been working with Blender off and on and done a couple of summer camps with kids. And I'm getting into it more and more, especially since they've basically redone it. A little bit of history about Blender and, and what it is. It was originally a commercial, fully commercial uh, 3D editing program made by a company in, I believe it was the Netherlands. And this is one of the few cases of ransomware. You've heard of shareware and freeware. The, they, they formed a company called NAN, or not a number, um, and it kind of didn't quite make it. So a whole bunch of folks got together 100,000 euros and got the investors for the original company to agree to sell them the source code. And so in 2002, which is only about 12 years ago, uh, Blender became licensed under the GPL. So it went kind of unusual to see a piece of uh, commercial software switch over like that. Since then, they've gone through various different projects. You may have seen some of this. If you look on YouTube, I'm not going to spend the time on showing too many of these, uh, any of these except for maybe the Gooseberry one. Um, their first movie they did with it was Elephant's Dream. Uh, let's see if we can get this a little brighter here. Um, then the big one in 2008 was Big Buck Bunny. 2008 is also when they started doing a major rewrite. One of the complaints about Blender is that its interface, I'm trying to think of anything I could say publicly. Um, it was really, really difficult to figure out. Now, to be honest, if you get into any 3D software, 3D Studio Max, whatever, there's a lot there. The commercial ones, Maya as well. There's a lot, but it was just really badly laid out. And there's still a couple things I'm going to show you that the professionals still twitch, especially the buttons. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but they decided to do a rewrite in 2008, and in 2011, version 2.5 has come out. Since then, we're already up at 2.71 something. It has, it's night and day. I mean, you, you can't even compare them. If you go and look for YouTube videos, and there's a lot of them, if it's anything less than 2.5, and I mean, yes, even 2.49, walk away. It, it just, it's a different program. I mean, really different program. Um, their first really, truly professional looking uh, one was 2010 with Sintel. How many people have actually seen Sintel? Yeah. How many people got the notice that Sintel was violating Sony's copyrights? I was actually on the website for that one point. Because Sony took some of Sintel for one of their promotional videos, which under the license for Sintel is okay, the wonderful automatic copyright crap on YouTube labeled Sintel as a copyright violation of Sony. And it took them two or three days to get it back. It's like, no, no, Sony's using their stuff, not the other way around. Um, the next big one was Tears of Steel. Technically, it was very well done. Story-wise, I still don't know what happened. Um, but it's, it's, you know, they used a lot of green screen and other things uh, that were not done in Sintel. And it's, you know, technically gorgeous. It's a little confusing as far as the story goes. So keep that in mind. Um, and now the big one, and I'm actually one of the folks who, in amongst the 3,000 names, may get my name on it. Uh, the Gooseberry Project is the one that they've been doing. And they've tried to do a Kickstarter type thing with it. Check it out, the video for it. And you'll have to forgive me. I can barely see. The screen with this. It's just a little one minute promo. I've actually got some of the models for this on another computer um, of the next movie that they're working on. It's pretty short, so. Oh, you're not going to be able to hear. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
I have no idea what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've gotten, I've actually got some of those models to play with and the rest. And I'm impressed by some of the folks who are involved in it. Um, but even though I'm part of the Blender Cloud thing, I'm not entirely sure what they're going to do with it. But it's looking pretty impressive. They got about $600,000 in funding for this. So I'm, I'm hoping it'll be actually pretty cool. So who knows what they'll end up actually doing for that. A um, couple of things to note about hardware with Blender. For just doing basic modeling, you can use a fairly basic computer. Um, one thing I will recommend, especially if you've got a laptop, this is not the laptop I intended to use. I've got a much more powerful one that's you know i7 quad core, GTX 580M graphics card. This is... I think a dual core, uh, what was Centrino, and it's got an Intel, old Intel graphics card. It also does not have a number pad, which for Blender, if you've got a laptop that you want to do this on, get yourself a number pad that does help. Um, the more cores, the better. This is one program that really does know how to use multiple cores. And if you really want to speed things up, NVIDIA and the CUDA support will let you do graphics accelerated rendering in uh, Blender. It does not, at present, properly support, and they keep working on it, the, uh, was it the OpenCL stuff for ATI. Um, so if you want graphics rendering, which can increase the time, uh, decrease the time it takes to create a image very, very quickly. Um, some of the stuff that I've done with just eight uh, the uh, quad core can still take 10, 15 minutes for an image, depending on what resolution you do. But the working with it isn't too bad. Okay. Now, as far as what it runs on, obviously Linux, but there's a version for Windows, there's a version for Mac, there's even a portable version of Blender that will run off of, well, basically Blender is just designed to run portably off of a USB drive for Windows. So if you go to portable apps, it's there. For modeling, Let's fire up Blender here. Now I like to get one of the more recent versions of it. Um, so I've gotten one of the personal package archives uh, for Blender, so you get the most recent one. If you do it with... Um, oh yeah, I can't remember. This is a movie that's it's like one episode a year, about an hour or two, but I was watching part of it. It's a little dark, but it's all done in Blender. Um, kind of cool. This will keep you more up to date if you go with the PPA. And here we have the default setup with the dreaded cube. Um, and unfortunately, because of resolution issues here, let's see if I can, I hate doing this, but let's see if I can just get this to fit on your screen as well here. So, basic interface, it is significantly improved. Uh, there's still a lot there. Um, and as it is, there's even a few interfaces that they hide from you because you only need them from time to time, um, but they are there. So you've got your, your basic setup and a few things for navigation. Um, you are working in a 3D environment, so... If you click the middle mouse button and hold it, you can kind of rotate the view around. This is the whole scene. If you hold down shift and hit the middle mouse button, you can actually move the, the scene around. And this is where the buttons come into, hand, into play. If you hit the seven, you've got basically the top view, the one, and you've got the front view, and the three, is a side view that forms a little L. And then the four and six keys rotate it left and right. The seven and eight keys rotate it up and down. And then the plus and minus keys zoom in and zoom out. Um, you even have a zero key, which will show you what the camera is presently seeing. 
And in addition, you can hit five to go from an orthogonal view versus perspective view. Dealing with views can be a big issue. You also have the ability to have more than one section to work on. You can go up to any of the borders. You'll see the little double arrows pop in. Right click, and you can say split area. And it can now put in a separate window, and you can decide to hide. Thankfully, they have made it so that most of the menus can now be hidden to give you more space. And you can have different views here, or you can um, have different properties. Like you can have your mesh here and the UV mapping window open in another window. Let's close this here. If you go on to it, and you can just tell it to join the area. It doesn't really matter which one. It also has a couple of shortcuts for views. There's a lot of shortcut, uh, keyboard shortcuts. And again, some people have complained about this. However, you can find most of these shortcuts in the menus themselves. Control-Alt-Q, well, that gives us a, splits up the screen into four, and you've got a fixed on the top, the front, the right, and then the adjustable view up in the upper right-hand corner. Some people like this because trying to align things can be a little bit difficult when you do it here. And you could just toggle it back. So let's put our pyramid here. And the big thing is that they now have tabs for different groups of tools. And let's actually just try and do a little bit of basics. With the slightly limited time, I'm going to have to kind of zoom through for a few things. I'm going to, my basic goal here is to show you some of the things that you can do with this. And I've got to find some way to turn back to my laptop and not blind myself. OK. So the classic cube, it's there from the beginning. Um, the one thing that will kind of confuse people is you select things by right-clicking on them. So if I try to left-click on this, it's moving the cursor. This cursor is what happens if I add a new cube it's automatically centered on the cursor. However, if I left click on this, it isn't selected. I'm just moving the cursor point. You have to right click on it to select it. You can go into user preferences and turn this off. And a lot of folks who work with Maya and 3D Studio Max do so because this one feature drives them buggy. The drawback with doing this is that almost every tutorial on Blender you're going to see on YouTube or on a DVD, and, and Blender.org does some really nice ones, is going to assume the default behavior. So keep that in mind. You've got a lot of pre-built shapes. Let's just delete a couple of the cubes here. And there's, you've got planes, cubes, circles, UV spheres, cylinders, and of course, you have Susan. Or Suzanne, I think it is. Now. Anybody know what this is the equivalent of? It's basically the, also the equivalent of the green pepper in GIMP. Has everybody ever wondered why they have a green pepper brush, paint brush in GIMP? It's still there. You can paint green peppers all over the screen. This was done because it was one of their first little test models. It got nicknamed Suzanne. And so for whatever reason, they give you a little monkey mesh that you can can play with. Um, okay. So you've got different modes, and you've also got different ways of viewing it. Um, you can have it textured, solid, with what we've got, and then you can also get to wireframe, which you can see how the model's put together. All right, you've got all the individual pieces. If I were to go into edit mode on an existing one, and you can either change modes right here or tab will put you between object mode and edit mode. Edit mode, I can now grab individual pixels by right clicking on them. And I could just simply distort the model that way. I mean, you can, if you really want to, take a existing mesh and just start pulling points all over the place. Um, and you're going to be doing some of this anyhow. It's handy to be able to adjust, but if it was the only tool you had, this would be a total mess. Now, as far as moving stuff around, again, you have 
tons and tons of options. Um, you can grab, oops. you've got some controls here on how you can move things. This basically is the move control. This one allows you to move it either in the y-axis, x-axis, or uh, z-axis. This lets you put in a gimbal. This gives you a resize handle. And you can even do all three of these. But if I just switch over here to let's move this point up, you can see that this one has the three arrows. The Z is the blue up arrow. Uh, the Y axis is the green arrow. And the X axis is the red arrow. If you turn it on to gimbal, it lets you rotate. Now, for a single point, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. But you can rotate the point in various axes. And you could also resize them. Again, for a single point, doesn't make much sense. Now, if you select the whole model, and A lets you select all or deselect all, I can now pick a particular, oops, sorry, got to grab the wrong thing here. If I can just I'm going to have to zoom in on this. Let's see. You can stretch things in particular directions. And you can distort it quite a bit if you really want to. So those are some of the tools for selecting that. And let's go into, let's delete this. And let's just put in a real simple cube again. Notice again the cube will go wherever we've sent that little center point. So you've got your cube. And let's move this down. Now, there's some other things that you can do with this. You can, of course, decide that you want to increase the number of uh, points. And one of the ways to do this is get to the tools. And there's a whole bunch of tools. And this is much nicer now. They've made it a little bit easier. You've got translation, rotation, scale, shrink, fatten, push, pull. Um, and they'll even have, for some of these, if we get through here, you have uh, the knife tool. You have the loop cut and slide, which is very commonly used. You can pick one particular area. Notice there's now a purple line. If I go up here, it's now this way. If I rotate up with the mouse wheel or down, I can add the number of slices, hit a, the left arrow key, and now that gives us the number. Now I line them up, hit again, and now that's actually cuts into the mesh. So if I were to deselect this, you'll now see that there's a whole bunch of new slices here. So you can keep cutting it apart like so. Other tools that you can use. And unfortunately, like I said, there's a lot of different tools here. Um, you can select vertices, which are the individual points, edges, which are basically any line between two points, or faces. So I've uh, changed it to select faces, and I see all the little periods on the middle of the faces. If I right-click on a face to select it, I can reshape it, but I can also hit E for extrude, and I can now bring out another piece. And I can pick a face over here and hit E for extrude and pull it out. And I could grab, let's see if I can get this face, E for extrude and pull it out. So this is one of the things that you could do with any face. Now I picked a cube, so everything's very, very square. Um, but it does a really nice job of just simply adding faces. Questions? I cannot see much of anything with the. Uh... Yeah. 
So, is Splendor used for animation mainly, or is it uh, sort of used for 3D well, Blender is an odd little program. Normally, my general opinion, when you find a program that tries to do everything, the general rule is when it tries to do everything, it tends to do nothing really well and everything kind of average. But it's gotten a lot better. It has the ability to create models. Um, it's got a rendering engine. It's got a compositing, which basically allows you to adjust your scene and models and RGB values, you know, red, green, blue values and gamma and all this fun stuff. Um, it's got a animation editor. Uh, it's got a rigging system so that you can actually create a skeleton inside of it. Um, it's, it allows you to do texturing, sculpting. It pretty well does just about everything. And in the case of like the movies that Sintel, Big Buck Bunny, uh, Tears of Steel, they did it all open source, and while they did use GIMP and a few others, the majority of it was done with just Blender. Well, the one thing Blender is not well suited for is CAD. No, it's not a good CAD program, though I, you can kind of do it. Um, for example here, if I put in a new cube, so I'm going to pick a spot here to put our new cube, go into create, put into a cube, and let's just move this over a little bit. You can scale by just hitting S or using the, in the tools there's a scale thing. So if I do S, Z, it will now only let me scale on the Z axis. Great, so I can kind of guess, and there are panels that you can pull out, that little extra panel, you see the plus sign right up there, where I could type in the number, but I can also put um, we'll say 1.2, and it'll basically make it 120% along that range. You could also do various other units. So you've got some capabilities, but if you ever were to suggest to somebody who does CAD that, oh, I'll use Blender, they'll bury you in the back lot someplace. Yeah, it's, that's not what this is for. It's gotten a lot better in some of that stuff. I don't see it ever being a competitor for CAD. Now, the, the way Blender handles data doesn't CAD handle a lot of dimensions and a lot of calculations in that sense that um, are not easy to do with the basic Blender CAD system? No, no, it would be be way too much work for that. Now, so its main market is for huh? Its main market then for is, is for art and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, games. It's used in movies, um, TV shows. Uh, PBS uses it quite a bit, um, some neat motion capture stuff, a um, lot of stuff like that. In fact, you'll see a lot of things on YouTube that are, are done with uh, Blender or 3D Studio Max or stuff like that. It also feeds into the MGLs, so you get a lot of 3D web stuff. Yeah, I'm actually just finally getting some, some books on that because I want to really get into that. Now, some of the other tools that you can get into here. Let's just select everything and get rid of it. Let's go back to object mode here. And they have some sculpting tools. So let's put in a UV sphere. Now a couple of things to note when you first, the very first instant you put in one of these pre-built meshes, you've got some options that you can play with that will disappear as soon as you even move anything. Right now we have the number of segments and the number of rings. Um, so I can start increasing the number of segments, the number of rings, or I could even decrease them. That obviously tells you how many points and squares you got with. So you've got your object. And we'll sh make it look solid. So there's our basic object to play with. You can issue C in this here, where are we at? Uh, under edit mode again, sorry, and you can just use tab to switch to edit mode. Um, we have, where's the sculpting tools here? Oh, sorry, duh. For that you have to go to sculpt mode, and they have some basic tools now for doing this. If you click on this, there's your list of tools that you can use to change the shape of your model.
Now, has anybody here played with ZBrush or Sculptress? It's a uh, commercial, though I actually, Sculptress is technically free to use, um, tool for making dynamic meshes. Up until recently, Blender couldn't do this. You could use these tools, but the results are not exactly what you would like. So let's pick this one here. We're going to do grab, and I'm going to grab. Does anybody notice what's happening when I grab an area of the model? It's, pull, it's distorting the mesh, and it's not adding any additional quads, right, or any additional data. I've still got the exact same number of points. Depending on what you're doing, this really limits your ability to um, create and truly sculpt a model. Great. That pretty well meant that people thought that this was, for the most part, a joke. You either had to make sure that your model had tons and tons of little squares to begin with before you could use this, or it was basically worthless. Well, I think it's in about 2.6 or 2.7. They add in dynamic topology. And now it's called DIN Topo. And it says, enable DIN Topo. Now the difference here, and it depends on the tool you've got. This is the fun part. Not all of them work for this. But let's pick blob. Now, maybe a little bit more. This basically lets it just kind of build up. Anybody notice the difference about what's happening here? It's adding lots and lots of triangles. In fact, you can start seeing the number of verts right now is uh, 296 vertices. Add a whole bunch of triangles. And if I continue to add this, you'll see that we're adding vertexes, we're already up to over 300 of that, a whole bunch of triangles. So this actually dynamically adds to the topology and lets you do a more natural sculpting. Um, there's some real nice advantages to this in that you can get your basic mesh put together with cubes and cylinders and everything else, and then you could go in and do true sculpting. Um, this is a huge thing. This was why people would use Sculptress in addition to Blender, because it could do this type of thing. It would just add in. So anybody figure out what some of the potential disadvantages of this is? Well, as you say, the geometry of your mesh isn't preserved, and it seems to be doing triangles where you're not squares anymore. Yeah. First problem is that it, and this is what Sculptress does as well, dynamic topology is much easier to do with triangles. And you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? Right? Polygon to polygon. Quads, specifically four-sided, they don't have to be square, but they four-sided, works better for animation, um, rigging, pretty well everything else. Triangles don't deform well. This, anybody ever play uh, the old World of Warcraft? Their models, games especially, you tend to use a lot of triangles, and they sometimes move a little weird. You can kind of see the skin folding in weird places sometimes. That's part of the problem. The other is you can very quickly here um, get a huge number of polygons. And the more things that your program has to keep track of, the slower it can be. The other thing that's a little weird about this, if you zoom in on it, it adjusts the size of the polygon for your zoom size. So you could do a lot of nice little detail, but you're going to get a lot of really tiny triangles mixed in with a lot bigger triangles and so on. So zooming can do some funky things for that. And that apparently is just a feature of dynamic topology. It's not necessarily uh, Blender's fault in this particular case. Um, but this allows you to now sculpt. And when you're done, there's several tools out there, and there's even a couple plugins for Blender that will let you do what's called retopology. You basically tell it to put a kind of a wrap around your model that sticks to the surface but has a lot less detail. Uh, it's called retopology. There's a couple of tools that you can get for it. And that way you can use it for modeling, for 3D printing, and so on. How are we doing for time? I didn't know exactly when this was supposed to. It's like, huh? 
Okay. Let's see if I could try and do one of the things I've been playing with recently. So let's get out of sculpt mode. Let's go into object mode. And let's, actually just for the heck of it, let's take a look at the mesh on this and see how bad it is. It's a little funky. You can kind of see... Uh, A little bit of strange stuff here showing up. Okay. Now, in addition, you can also do path. So I'm going to click on a path here, and this is similar to the concept of paths that they do in things like Photoshop and GIMP and so on, where it's basically a set of points that you can do things along. It doesn't really exist it's more of a direction for doing something. So if I add in a path here, okay. I, oh, you always have to be careful that you know where your insertion point's at. Basic path, and if we get into edit mode, you can see that there's various little points in it. Let's see if I can find them on the screen. There we go. So you can deform it. and make shapes. You can, of course, even at the ends, hit E for extrude and add another point. So you can make some really dynamic shapes. Now, the thing that you can do is you can actually play other shapes along this path and then turn it into a mesh. So, for this, we're going to go back to object mode for the time being going to put the cursor down here, and I'm going to go in and put under curves a circle. So you can see the leftover path there. I've got my circle. I'm going to scale it to be a bit smaller, 0.20, 20% size. Okay. Now I'm going to select my path. Apparently, I put two in there, but I'll keep the curved one. And again, just to give you an idea, I've all, all I've been touching on is just the modeling tools. We haven't talked about the modifiers, um, textures. There's, again, a huge amount to this program. But under the tools over here, you'll see that there's a variety of things. And you've got the camera selected, and then you'll see a little world, a cube, a little chain, and a little wrench. And next to it, kind of looks like a half U. Each of these, if you go over them, this allows you to put in modifiers. Um, this, however, allows you to basically adjust the object data. And if we go around, there's a section under here called geometry. And you'll see a bevel object. And I can pick my circle. And it now takes that circle and wraps it along the length of that path. Yep, it's a tube. Now, at this point, I can make adjustments to the circle if I want to. So if I decide to change the number of polygons that make up the circle, I can make it a square tube, um, and so on. When I'm all done, you can, and you can find this in the menu, but the shortcut is Alt-C, and I'm going to put this stuff up um, for folks to check out. You can change it into an actual mesh. And I, apparently, I deleted something. Control-Z, Alt-C. Mesh from curve data. Oh, do I have it actually selected? I don't. There we go. So now we've got an actual mesh. It can now be, if we get into edit mode, you can grab faces, you can extrude from it, you can do everything else. So you can make very fluid, especially if you need tubes, and think about things like tree roots, uh, branches, uh, pipes for a car, 
a lot of different things. You can basically create a path for it and then just have it create the mesh along it. I think this is probably one of the, the funner things to play with uh, when you first get into uh, modeling in there. Questions, comments, rebuttals so far? Yeah. So we could taper off on one side of the path so that you could get kind of like one cone? Oh, well, because it's now a mesh, we can adjust it. So let's move this down here. And let's just change this so we're selecting vertices, A for none. And there's several different selection tools. Again, I had to try and figure out how to pare this down. This is kind of just an overview. If you hit B, that allows you to do block select. And I can select those four points now, right? The four points at the end. I can now do scale, and I can shrink the distance between those points down. And now I've got a tapered point. So you can grab individual points, groups of points, move them around. You can grab faces. You can scale them. So even though it starts out as a square, you can make trapezoids. You can do a whole variety of different things with this. And once you've got um, your basic model put together, you can also, of course, take these to uh, 3D printers. This has a plugin that you just have to turn on. It's already there for helping you figure out whether or not your model could be printed. Um, Blender actually makes, and it's a great overview DVD of just what Blender does as well from the Blender Institute for uh, 3D printing. Goes through, you know, my first attempt, I tried to make a little piece of jewelry for somebody. And I did just about everything wrong you could. Um, I should have flipped it upside down. I had it so it was going to be printing on its thinnest parts. Um, it was definitely not what they call manifold. There were holes in it all over the place. Uh, and thankfully, this software kind of told me, you suck, try again. Um, but at least, you know, it told me, you've got this wrong, you've got this wrong, you've got this wrong, go fix it. Um, so that's also a common use for Blender, in addition to doing animations and scenes. I mean, some people will just do digital stills. But you can create scenes that don't exist. And the nice thing is, unlike a photo, someone says, you know, I would rather you did it from this angle. You go in, rearrange the camera, rearrange the fake lights, render, an hour later, you've got the new picture, versus trying to get real people out in the same lighting and the same location, you know, that type of thing. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little idea of what you can do with modeling. There's so much in here. Um, I don't even know how to, to begin. And different, every single YouTube video I found, everybody has their own neat little tricks. Some of which are really useful and some I'm not so thrilled about. I could try and show you just the concept of UV unwrapping if somebody is curious about, uh, UW, sorry. UV, yeah, UV unwrapping. W is only when you've got the third, yeah. How many people here just go, wow, I have no idea where to even start? <laughs> you can actually put text in here, yes. Oh, and for those folks who like Python, it's written in Python. When you highlight over most of the tools, let's see if it shows up well here. A little pop-up thing usually does. And underneath here it says, Python, bpy.ops.mesh.primitive underscore torus underscore add parentheses. It tells you what Python call it's actually making with that tool. It even has a text editor in there for editing the Python that's actually running the program. I actually played around with it once and made one of my menus disappear. Thankfully, it's fairly easy to put it back. But it's, it's designed to be incredibly highly programmable. Again, for most people, that's way more than they ever need to do. But um, it is there. And if you decide you want to add your own features to it, you can. Um, again, there's some wonderful DVDs out there for beginners. I've got a whole list of links that I just did not get put up. A couple of sites that you might be interested in. If you put UV unwrap, it's going to be too big of a topic. Maybe something just along the lines of putting a background image. Oh, yeah. I could do that real quick. 
Um, here's some links to think about. Again, I'm going to put these up. There's the Blender Fort Foundation, the folks who actually continue to develop this and develop the movies, blender.org. Uh, CG Cookie is for several different programs, not just Blender, but they've got a Blender. Blender Cookie is just kind of a subdirectory of it. They've got some stuff for free, and they've got some nice tutorials for free. If you get an account, you get to see a few more of them for free. And then they've also got the pay stuff. Uh, there's Blender Nerd, Blender Nation. Uh, there's actually, a, on Wikibooks, a Blender 3D Noob to Pro book. Not too bad, and hey, it's, it's free. BlendSwap is a community of folks who put up their various different models and meshes for folks to share and use. So you don't always have to create your own. And some people actually do make money selling, selling their own models. A few years back, I actually was able to make another one of the uh, Thursday night plugs. And you had a lawyer here talking about protecting intellectual property on Second Life. And people were making models and objects to sell inside of Second Life. And so Blender is used for that. Apparently, some of these people are making six figures a year, or at least they were a few years back, selling fake objects to people in Second Life, many of which don't have a first, but hey, <laughs> a different issue. Um, so I, I put that up. Um, I can at least talk about, as far as background images, yes. If you're going to do modeling. Oh, I tried to get all my favorite ones there. Yes, Blender Guru. In fact, I will just make a quick note of that so I don't forget to put it up. He's got a, a monthly uh, how-to that he will send out on his mailing list. He's also got instructional videos and, and okay. especially uh, realistic landscape and nature type. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, in fact, I think I've got a couple of packages for his. He's, the classes are a little bit few, about four or five hundred bucks, but from what I understand, if you're ready, they're, they're worth it. Um, odd thing about 3D modeling is most folks start out with 2D. Um, they're going to draw what they're hoping to build, right? So they'll have flat images. Sometimes it's still done, you know, on actual cellulose paper and uh, pen. Sometimes it's done with something like GIMP or Inkscape or the rest. But then you need to have the reference image in there to work from. So if you're going to try and create a model, you should have the option to put in a background image. So for this, we pull out this little extra menu. Now, again, this menu can be brought out by sliding it out or just N for the, the extra menu. I try to remember why they called it that. But one of the options is background images. So I can tell it to, and you can add many different images here. So I'm going to add an image. And I'm going to tell it to find, let's see here, under Lexar, Blender Talk. And let's see, we've got a couple of options for this. But we could just do this. And let's see if we can get this showing up here. Okay. Come on, where is it hitting? Draw back with working with such a small screen here. All views. Let's try from the top. So view from the top. So you can put in images in your different views, front view, side view, top view, if you're good enough at drawing that, and use those as guides while you're trying to do some of your modeling. That's also a really handy trick. Um, I've seen people take front views and side views of their heads, and if you get them roughly the same size and lined up, it makes it a little bit easier to create a 3D model. But if you're not in the right view, you don't get to see the image. Correct. But that also means that you're probably at the wrong angle to be doing what you're doing. Now, in this case, this would be a dumb place to put this view because we're, we're trying to view it from the top. This would obviously should have been put into the front view. But I can change that from top to, nope, this one should be shown in front. And that way, 
It's only when I'm in the front view that it actually shows up. Kind of nice that. And I can at least talk a little bit about UV unwrapping. Um, it's a little confusing at first. The reason why they use UV is because X, Y, and Z are already in use, right? You've already got the X and Y and Z coordinates for the model. What you do is you want your model to look nice. Um, you know, even if I just simply make it a solid surface, unless I want everything to look like it's made out of gray plastic, it starts getting a little iffy after a while. So what you do is you basically take all those little triangles and you flatten them out onto an image. And then you paint that image, and then it remaps those what we would normally call x, y coordinates, but they're called uv because x, y is already being used, onto the 3D object. All right. So, for example here, do I have one that's already pre-done? Um, no, I don't think I have that with me. But if we were to take our model here and select it, so we've got our model, and I'm going to have to split the screen. Let's get rid of some of this here. And we've got, these are all the different things that come with Blender. You've got your Python co console, the file browser, the information, some of this is already open, user preferences, the outliner, which is already up there, um, properties, which is right there, You've got a logic editor, because it does do games as well. You could actually make a game that runs in Blender. Um, node editor for the compositor, again, that's for end production stuff. Movie clip editor, video sequence editor, UV image editor. Um, I forgot what NLA is. Dope sheets for animation. Uh, graph editor, again, for animation. The last stuff down there is mostly for animation. And of course, the 3D view. This is all the stuff that comes with it. I'm going to switch it over to UV image editor. And you get a default blank image here. Let's see here. Oh, that won't work. And now I could take my model, and there's a couple of different op options with it. If we go to mesh, Oops, it decided to deselect. Come on. If we go to mesh in this, you've got the options for UV unwrap. You could just do it UV unwrap, smart UV project. They've got several different options. Let's see what the smart one actually does here. Okay. So We've got not the prettiest thing in the world. It tried to take all those little flat faces and spread them out on this image. I can now actually save this as an image. It will actually have that outline on it. I can then put an extra layer in GIMP on top of it and paint what I want. You don't want to leave that there because the lines can interfere. And then when we pull this image back in, it can paint that onto the tube. Now that's one way of doing it. Let's get rid of this here. Let's get rid of um, come on. Remember how you just get rid of the darn thing. Oh, replace image. I want to do it with just blank. Fine. And you could also have multiple UVs for this here. Let me just close this without saying. Yeah, it's still there. Another way that you can do it, of course, if I deselect it, it goes away. You can also, by holding down, I think it's control here, pick 
sorry. Oh, let's do the faces here. Boy, working on such a small monitor. There we go, faces. Now, unfortunately, it's still mapping to the previous one. But if we hadn't already mapped it, you can actually just simply pick individual faces and see how they're laying out there. Um, for some objects, this is another way to do it. The third way, which takes a little bit more work, is you have to create what's known as scenes. You literally can go and mark different parts of where you're going to cut it and basically unwrap it and then unwrap the various different pieces. Sometimes UV unwrapping can be really easy. Other times, it can take a little while. And once you've got the map, you save it, you can map different images to it. So even though you've got one model, there's nothing saying that you can't put different faces or different you know, eye colors or different skin tones. You may notice in some background characters, especially in animations, they really kind of look like they all came out of the same mold. That's because they did. Eh, copy, eh, let's put a different map on it, some different clothes, away you go. Because um, why on earth create a totally brand new model for stuff that's just going to be in the background? Unless it somehow adds to the story. Now, UV unwrapping is one that's taken me a while to kind of get the hang of, and there's still a few things I'm dealing with. It's an odd concept that you basically peel the skin off, flatten it onto an image, and then you can paint that, and then it, the program basically wraps that back onto the model. Yeah, demoing with a cube would have been better. Uh, well, uh, again, I don't know. It's 9.30. When does this officially? Let's go ahead and wrap it up. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. We'll, we'll OK. Uh, well, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free. There is a lot to this. There's a lot of good books out there um, and a lot of tutorials. And I'm hoping in the next year or so to get a class through the curriculum committee so I can actually start teaching this, which means Part of why I'm trying to gear up on it as fast as I can. They made such a huge change from pre-25 to after-25. And it seems to even be speeding up. 271 is significantly faster, even without a graphics accelerator, for rendering. Um, they've been improving things quite a bit. They had two summers where Google funded like five or six projects each summer for rewriting parts of Blender. It's I, I'm not saying it's the easiest program to use, but it's probably one of the most powerful and polished uh, graphical open source projects out there. And it really doesn't resemble the original program much anymore. Um, it can be very handy to use a six degree of freedom mouse, like a space navigator. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is there is a uh, program in your repositories that is uh, Debian or, or Fedora or whatever, Space Nav D, which is an alternative connection to that mouse. Don't use the driver that is supplied by the vendor. It doesn't work for you. Depending on what you're doing, I also uh, use a Wacom tablet with this. And for some of the sculpting, that could be really handy. It still makes it a, having the ability to rotate a little bit easier around can be quite handy too because that's the weirdest thing is you're working in a 3D environment but obviously your monitor is 2D despite what some manufacturers may claim. You know, if you're putting glasses on that's not really 3D. You would need a screen out to here. Any other questions? Does it have a mode where you can have a stereo monitor set up and you know with glasses basically you have to remove the pressure? Well, I know people use it to create that because you can easily clone models and separate them. But as far as a view mode, they might. But I've, I've never looked into that. Who else? Say you're going to knock out a, a little 3D tux model, kind of like you had up there. And it's not the Sistine cha Chapel of tuxes, but something that I can recognize. What would you ballpark how long that's going to take you? Well, uh, we're assuming that you've never used Blender before. No, no, no. Somebody who's familiar with it. Oh, not somebody who's familiar with it. Um, well, again, if you're just doing the basics, it should be a couple of hours. Or just a couple of minutes, just Google for tux.blend. Oh, yeah, you can always grab one of the existing blends. If 
but I'm saying if you're doing it yourself. A um, couple of hours depending on how much detail you want. I mean, you could, text is simple enough, you could probably do it in a half hour if you didn't really care about the details. Throw in an extra, it actually would be fairly easy to, pay. in fact, there are tutorials on how to do tux in Blender. Um, you might be able to do it in less than an hour. And with care, it'd even be printable. The vast majority of the time, I assume you are you know, taking some other model and modifying that. Too. Yes. Well, you also kind of make your own set. It has some other features that I haven't dealt with. Um, the particle physics is really quite funky because you think, oh, particle physics. Great. What's that for? Um, it can be used for light effects. Hair particles can actually be used for grass, so you can have it randomly put clumps of grass in a scene, in, like it would do for hair. You could turn the ha uh, hair into leaves and have it randomly put leaves around. There's even some add-ons where it will, they've got some plug-ons where you could do ivy generation. There's some additional models you could turn on that have like pipes and gears in them. So there's a lot of pre-built stuff you can work with. And one other thing that's interesting, you can do, oh, I just forgot the name. Um, you can basically program models so they can only move in certain directions. So you can make what looks like a mechanical model that effectively works. No, not an armature. This is instead of armature. In, in for kinematics? Oh, the physics? Uh, no, no. It's, it, there's actually, you can tell it that this thing can only rotate in this degree. Constraints, yes, sorry. There are some constraints that you can put in. And people have actually created little engines that as you move this one little piece, everything else just rotates with it, and there's no armature involved. Um, he claimed this was a little book off of Kindle that, you know, armatures are dead. They're not, but at least you've got an alternative. Armatures are where you literally build a skeleton inside of your model, attach the various different parts of the model to the skin, and then if you move the bones, your model pulls with it, makes it poseable. Um, you could even go very further with like inverse kinematics and put controls where you can grab a control and it does this entire motion. You, know, you grab the foot and it just, everything attached to it moves appropriately. Now to properly rig a model, for real simple stuff in Tux, again, half an hour. For something for a person where you want the full range of motion, depending on how much time you got to spare, it could be weeks. Of course, they actually have a rigify thing if it's a bipedal person that can speed up that process significantly to maybe an hour. It's kind of cool. Well, unless there's anything else, I hope that at least gave you an idea of what it can do. This is not, uh, couldn't really do the talk of, well, hey, now you know how to model in Blender. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's a class at MCC, isn't it? It's going to be. It's going to be. I've got to write it yet. 